Hi, in the previous video we took a look at the classic IBM PC Junior computer and how it was a big flop back in the 80s and I'll link it in down below and at the end of this video if you haven't seen it. And one of the things I uh, briefly mentioned in the teardown of this is how the uh, game port uh, joystick controller circuitry um, actually worked. Uh, when I was tearing down the PCB, we saw a 558 timer in there. And I explained that this was uh, quite common back in the day, but I thought we'd take a deeper look at that because it's rather interesting how this works, I think. It's rather clever. So let's take a look at the classic um, analog joystick. This is the original IBM joystick from back in the day. Um, IBM didn't actually, I don't think they actually made this because the original IBM PC actually didn't come with a joystick or a game uh, controller port as it was uh, called back in the day but you could actually buy a plug-in card which actually was just the game controller PC card and that became the de facto industry standard joystick interface for the PC from then until the end of time until like USB uh, joysticks took over. Um, so they lasted a long time this game controller joystick interface and it started out just as that uh, single plug-in peripheral card which could control two different joysticks through a D15 connector and a Y splitter cable but of course that took up an entire slot in your PC and well dedicating the whole slot to a uh, game controller kind of sucked so eventually uh, these multi-combo I.O. cards took over where you could actually you know they would integrate a serial port, parallel port, a joystick controller ports, uh, real-time clock and all this sort of stuff into the one uh, expansion card to try and save slots but the circuitry remained exactly the same for like a, a long time and there's probably other brand personal computers back in the day that used a similar type of analog joystick interface and that's exactly what this is it's actually an analog uh, joystick it, it wasn't just buttons you could actually get real uh, feedback and real fine control if you moved it just a little bit then your you know your spaceship would just move a little bit or whatnot the PC could actually read the position of the joystick on here and the standard IBM ones had uh, two buttons like this it was exactly the same on the uh, Tandy 1000 which is a basically a clone of the IBM uh, PC Junior and was massively more popular than the PC Junior and I've done a video once again linked in at the end of this where I design a turbo board uh, for the Tandy 1000. That's a real old video, but it's interesting. So stick around and check that one out. But exactly how did these analog joystick controllers work and what circuitry was required to actually read them? Well, let's do the first thing, tear this one apart. I can just move this and you can see that these two uh, rotating arms on here would actually uh, just connect up to just a regular carbon uh, pot in there, a potentiometer, a variable resistor, and it, they'd connect directly onto the uh, shaft in there and simply turn that pot. So the resistance value, you can see that they're only using uh, the two wire one here, so they're not uh, center tapping that, but it's fine, you can do it uh, either way, and that's how they do it. So they need to read uh, the resistance value on this pot. This joystick's actually quite interesting in that it has a, uh, a free mode. You see how it actually springs back in both directions well you could actually move it to the corner and then you could go free like that and then it would be free to sort of stay it didn't spring back in that direction but it would still spring back in that direction and you could do that for uh, both of those or either or axes like that so that was actually a really neat thing on the analog PC joystick a hundred K like that and I'm pretty sure that was uh, just like an industry standard value and you'll notice that they've got a little bit of a bodge in here they've got uh, some caps does that go into the uh, shield of the cable perhaps just some uh, noise suppression there I don't remember my Tandy 1000 joystick ever having that so how do we read the value from this pot well that's where it gets a bit interesting now, of course, you might be thinking that the obvious solution, you've got your uh, potentiometer here, just hook it up to your 5 volt rail and your ground, and then you just, you'll just you get 0 to 5 volts, depending on the location of the joystick there, and then you'd simply feed it into an analog to digital converter, and you get your 8-bit or whatever value out, and Bob's your uncle, right? 
Well, you've got to remember that this was like the late 1970s, early 1980s, and ADCs, these were actually quite expensive back then, and you'd need four of them. You'd need at least a four-channel one to read um, a, a dual joysticks in the uh, PC, two pots per thing. And of course, there was no such thing as microcontrollers back then. Essentially, what we take for granted these days is of our pick, our uh, AVRs, our ARM microcontrollers, and they've got built-in ADCs up to 12 bits and uh, like all these peripherals built in. Basically, microcontrollers didn't exist back then. We had microprocessors, which is what all these PCs ran on. And if you wanted ADCs, you had to buy a separate ADC chip, and they were quite expensive, because you've got to remember, something like, uh, say, the first sort of uh, reprogrammable microcontroller, the PIC 16C84, which used E squared PROM, none of this uh, flash rubbish, that didn't came, come out until 1993, and that didn't even have a built in ADC. So, you know, you take these things for granted these days, but you haven't always had these micros with all these peripherals and ADCs built in, especially back then. So the clever designers went, well, we've got a cut cost. Doesn't get much cheaper than a triple five timer. <laughs> Let's take a look. So you should be familiar with the classic triple five timer and the various building block circuits that come along with that. And it's been popular for what, four decades or something. Um, and they still mass produce this thing. Found a triple five timer doing little uh, one shot and other timing type applications in a lot of the old uh, vintage PCs from the 70s and 80s. In this case, the classic um, one shot monostable circuit. And you're no doubt familiar with this classic building block circuit. We've got our resistor up here. You connect the discharge and the threshold pins. I won't go through how the triple five uh, timer works. Triple five timer t-shirt, my hand drawn t-shirt linked in down below, by the way, if you want to check it out. Um, highly recommend you do. And then a cap going to ground. And basically, uh, we have a negative going trigger pulse coming in. So when your trigger pulse goes low like that, it starts the timer, which will produce a single pulse, the pulse width of which the time of the pulse width is determined via the RC time constant here. And of course, if you replace the resistor here with the pot, used inside the joystick here, bingo, you've got yourself a proportional time pulse, variable time pulse, that will vary based on the position of the joystick. And because you've got a PC which has various timers and things built in, we can actually time in software how long that pulse takes. It's neat. So there's no need to convert an analog value into a digital value using an ADC. You can simply do it using a timer-based approach, and PCs are really good at doing timing. But of course, you need four of these triple five timers. Yeah, whoa, you didn't want to use four separate chips. Bugger that. <laughs> but of course, the triple five timer is available in both the single one, which is the triple five, also the five five six, which is the dual triple five, and ta-da! The 558 quad triple five timer, not very often used uh, these days. And this is what you saw in the teardown of the IBM PC Junior, which uh, has the original uh, IBM game card or whoever made the design of the IBM game card. It used a 558 timer, which is four triple five timers in the one chip. And it was super cheap. And there's basically not much more you had to add to it. So it had the four uh, channels. We could hook up the four joystick pots here. Um, a, four capacitors going to ground. They'd all be the same value. It might be typically 10 nanofarads or something like that. Depends on the, um, the, the speed of the PC and the timing and the 100K used up here and stuff like that. And bingo, you would actually tie all the triggers together like this because they were independent timers in here. But if you tied them all together, then they, then they all start at once, as we'll see in a minute why, and then um, you would get the different pulse links out depending upon the position of each one of the joysticks, the X and Y on joystick one and the X and Y on joystick two. Beautiful. And all the PC has to do is read the time period from there to there, there to there, there to there, and there to there. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. 
But of course, uh, the PC being the PC, it uses a, a data bus. In the case of the IBM PC, of course, because it used the 8088 processor, it had an 8-bit uh, data bus instead of the 8086 processor, which had a full 16-bit data bus. We have to somehow get this hooked up to the database so that we can uh, use the timers in the PC to actually time it. So how do we do that? Easy. We just uh, hooked it up to a latch here or a buffer slash uh, latch, and then we would, of course, do the address decoding. I won't go into architectures of uh, PCs and stuff like that, but basically every every peripheral, everything, every I.O. port or memory port on the PC needed a particular address. So it'll have an address decoder here, uh, typically using discrete uh, and you know NAND gates and or whatnot, stuff like that. So they decode the uh, address, which is specific to the joystick, and it'd enable the chip, and you could read back the values on all, the, on all four of these um, timer um, outputs here. But of course, the joystick also had two buttons on, so you could use the other four inputs here for the two buttons, and of course, you'd have an 8-bit uh, data latch, which then would go off to the PC bus. But how do you trigger it? Well, you use the address, same address decode, but instead of reading back the data, you would actually write, this PC write pin would actually go to the trigger. So you just write something to that address. You, it doesn't matter what data you wrote because the data was uh, useless. All you wanted to do was trigger these timers. So you'd write to the particular joystick address, and then you'd uh, continually read back and until the end of the time period. But the problem with this approach, of course, is that it requires software timing loops, and that posed a real problem to PCs as they got faster and everything else. So there were very, I believe there were various uh, schemes eventually to compensate for that sort of thing. And ultimately, um, all of this um, stuff would be built into uh, the motherboards instead of add-on cards would be built in to the uh, motherboard chipsets and things like that. But of course, you still use the classic 558 on the output, but you know, all this stuff uh, typically started to get integrated into the chipsets as time went on. So there you go. I think that's a rather cheap and clever way to do it. All you needed was a 558, a couple of R's and C's, hook it up to your D15 connector for your joystick and your uh, uh, buttons over here. And Bob's your uncle. You could just have a little address decode and read it back. Very simple. And of course, if you wanted uh, greater precision in reading the position of the pot, you had to do finer and finer reads on your port so that you could read the uh, pulse width there with greater precision. And we can actually see the value change here if we move the joystick, but uh, of course you could trim it. You had these uh, little uh, trimmers on the front that you can move back and forth to uh, centre that. And you can see the physically the joystick actually, um, uh, sorry, the pot actually moving back and forth as I tweak that uh, trimmer on the top. So, you know, you might want to trim it to the centre or something like that. And if I move the joystick, you can see that it... Uh, went all the way with LBJ up to 120K. These pots weren't very uh, precise back in the day, and then it'd go down to zero like that. So you'd get the full, um, mostly the full range of the pot there. And if we actually have a look at the IBM PC Junior motherboard, we can actually see the triple five timer up in there as we saw in our previous teardown. And there it is, a classic National Semiconductor, genuine, none of that rip-off rubbish, uh, 558 quad triple five timer. You'll notice some, uh, the, the, some of the timing caps there, because of course you didn't want your uh, PC shorting out and having no resistance at all in series with your cap. So they'd uh, put some uh, resistors in series uh, for that, just to give you an, like a, a restricted end stop type value on your joystick when your joystick shorted out and went to zero. And of course, due to the uh, proximity to the 558 there, that's almost certainly the buffer uh, used to go onto the PC bus. Yeah, absolute classic SEM4 LS244. Uh, and they'd have probably some of your decoding stuff up here as well. And of course, I'd love to show you the uh, timing on this. Unfortunately, if we have a look at the outputs here, of course, um, then it actually does nothing. It's actually not uh, triggering the output, it's not giving any pulses um, whatsoever on there because the timers wouldn't actually turn on or trigger unless the software was actually writing to that address. So you're running a game or something that was continually polling the joystick. So in this case, this PC Junior doesn't work. Oh, 
Now, the Tandy 1000 is interesting in that it actually uh, uses a slightly different hardware implementation. It doesn't use the triple five timer. So let's actually take a look at how it actually does it. Here's the block diagram here. It's essentially doing exactly the same thing as what we were doing with the triple five timer. It's producing a proportional pulse width uh, timer output uh, based on a trigger signal, but it's doing it using an integral here, and that's what that little fancy symbol is, uh, integral of IDT there. What that means is that it's just producing a ramp, which starts at zero when you trigger it, and that voltage ramps up. And if we have a look at the uh, schematic here, you can see that that uh, little ramp generator there with the uh, JFET there, it just generates a ramp voltage, which then goes into uh, comparators there, which then the joist, the voltage from the joystick just goes into these four comparators. And then of course, once the ramp voltage gets up and reaches each individual joystick position, the comparators flip over and produce a uh, zero instead of a one or vice versa. And then the PC can actually read that as a time period exactly the same as the triple five timer except the hardware implementation is a little bit different but it works exactly the same and you can see the uh, 74 ls244 buffer on there and the right and the address decoder and the right signal and the read signal is work as well it works exactly the same as the original ibm pc uh, game adapter in fact the software as long as you kept the uh, read and write address the same the software wouldn't even know the difference, wouldn't know whether you're using the uh, integrator there, like the ramp generator and the comparator, or whether or not you're using the triple five timer. Still going to work exactly the same. Software wouldn't notice a difference, uh, except if there's some variations in there in the actual uh, timing itself. But apart from that, no, nah, you'd get the same thing. And I'd love to show you the uh, Tandy 1000 working as well. This is the IBM PC Junior, the 1000's down in my storage bunker. Um, but I can't find my five and a quarter inch boot floppies, so I <laughs> just can't get the thing going. And without that software, there's nothing to trigger the pole in or whatnot without even being able to boot up DOS to uh, then, uh, you know, be able to write to the joystick address to trigger the damn thing so that we can see the timing and stuff like that but i hope uh that gave you a good idea of how the uh ibm uh pc joystick game adapter actually uh works it's not the greatest uh solution because it is uh you know software timing uh dependent you've got to be able to accurately measure the uh time periods and do it fast enough to respond to all the uh joystick controls and of course pcs back then they had to share all the same bus and they were all doing you know had to do everything at once but uh you know it it actually worked back in the day and that was a fairly cheap and simple solution to bring the component cost down instead of using an ADC or something like that. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss it down below in the YouTube comments or on the EV blog forum. And there's a couple of videos here at the end you should check out. And thanks to all my patrons and supporters who uh, help keep this channel going. You can probably find a link here at the end somewhere too if you want to join. Anyway, catch you next time.